Second Peter chapter one, and let's start reading at verse number five. Second Peter chapter one, verse five. Chapter one, verses one to four. Last week, uh, we saw everything that we have because we know Him. Because we know Him, these these are the things that we have. Because we're saved, this is the blessing of salvation. But now, in verses five to uh, five to seven, or there are things that we need to add to what we have. And so let's look at these things in verses 5 to 7, and we'll read down to verse number 15. It says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. This evening, as we look at this text, we're going to look at these things. That's mentioned here in Second Peter chapter 1. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this evening as we get to study these, these verses here in Second Peter chapter 1. Lord, it's so exciting to consider the things that we are to add to our faith. And I pray, Lord, that we will do that with all diligence so that we can be the fruitful Christian that you'd have us to be. And I pray, Lord, this evening that as I preach your word, that you'll fill me with your spirit to speak to each and every heart according to each need. And I pray that the spirit will work in each and every heart, Lord, and uh, just minister to each one of us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Monday was a first for Bethany and I. We drove up to camp and we left without one of our kids. We dropped off Ethan at camp and on the car ride there, Bethany says to me, are you going to talk to him or am I? <laughs> just like, <laughs> what do you mean? Just, well, we got to tell him some things. I'm like, okay, I'll talk to him. Say, Ethan, okay, this is what you got to do. Uh, I don't know. You, you go, Bethany. So we're on the way there. We're talking. And, okay, listen to your counselor. That's number one. Listen to your counselor, we said. Uh, always make sure that your counselor knows where you are and what you're doing. Uh, we, Ethan, we wanted to make sure that he put his glasses in a safe spot. When you go to bed, Ethan, make sure you know where you put your glasses. Don't put them on the floor. Make sure they're up somewhere, somewhere safe, and make sure you know where they are in the morning. And, uh, you know, Ethan, he's getting pretty good at swimming, but I'm still not confident. That can be a little bit of a worry wart sometimes. So I say, Ethan, when you, get to, when you go to the swimming, make sure you wear a, a life jacket, okay? Make sure you have something on to keep you floating. So anyways. Uh, just little things like that all the way up to camp. We just kept telling him all these things until finally we dropped him off. And I'm sure you understand what was going on. You know, we, uh, as parents, we just wanted to make sure that for this week, he'd be okay. Because for this week, he wasn't going to have us around to make sure he was okay. And uh, so we wanted him to remember 
certain things. Be mindful of certain things. And as I consider that this evening, I realize that's what's happening in this text. In this passage of scripture that we're looking at this evening, Peter is going somewhere. He's telling us that he is about to put off his earthly tabernacle. He tells us in, in John 21, it's according to what his, the Savior had showed him. And you remember in John chapter 21, how Jesus told Peter how when he was young, he girded himself, but when he was old, another would gird him. And it said, this make he of the death that he would die. And how he would die for the Savior. And Peter now is at the end of his earthly journey in that he knows that this day is coming. He knows that he, this is the, the, his last days on earth. The Romans are, are coming after Peter. And he's writing, he's like, before I go, I got to write one more letter to the church. <laughs> got to write one more letter to the Christians scattered abroad. I got to make sure before I go that they remember these things, that they keep in mind these things. He says, listen, I, I know that you already know this stuff. You know, I know that Ethan already knows to put his glasses in the in safe spot, okay? I know you already know this stuff, but I want you to be mindful of it. He says, even though I know that you know it, I want to make sure that I stir up your mind for these things. That's what it says here in verses 12 to uh, 15. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. I know you know this. He says, yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. That tabernacle is his body. As long as I'm here in this physical world to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He says, I know I'm going to die for the Savior soon. There in verse 14. And so he says, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Have these things always in remembrance. You know, you go through these verses, starting at verse 8, all the way down to verse 15. You see this phrase just keep popping up. These things. These things. In fact, five times. And those short verses, the phrase is used, these things. Now, if God has to tell us about these things so often, I dare say these things, they must be important. And so let's consider these things this evening. And number one, we think of the, the priority of these things. Five times it's repeated. If God emphasizes it so much, then these things must be important. These things better be considered. If God relates these things so often, then we must ask ourselves, what are we doing with these things? The priority of these things. Verse number five says, and beside this, giving all diligence. All diligence. Diligence is when you do something diligently. It means you're working hard at it. It means you're giving your, your best effort to it. It means you're, you're not slacking off concerning this. And just to make sure you don't slack off, it's added. It's like a double positive. It's all diligence. As diligently as you could possibly be, be diligent to add to your faith these things these things. In verses 1 to 4, we, we saw last week what we have just because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. We have like precious faith, and with that like precious faith, through the knowledge of him, uh, with that like precious faith, we, we have uh, grace and peace. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have great and precious, exceeding great and precious promises We've escaped the pollution of this world. We're partakers of the divine nature, all because we're saved by God's grace, all because we know him. God did his part. But now in verse five, it's our turn to do our part. It's our turn to do our job 
and, and living the Christian life. It's the priority of these things. And you go down through this list and there's seven things. There's chair, or it starts with, uh, with virtue, then knowledge, then temperance, then patience, then godliness, then brotherly kindness, and finally charity is the last on this list. And these things, they're, they're what we call Christian virtues. We'll look at them a little bit more in just a moment. But these things are, are simply things that look like Jesus. And we're to add them to our lives. We're to add them to, to our Christianity. Uh, you know, it reminds me of in the world how people are diligent to perfect their craft, right? Uh, they're diligent if they need to know certain skills for their job, they will they will add these skills to the resume, to their job, to help them do better at their job. Uh, last night was the baseball all-star game, and I like baseball. It's one of my favorite sports. And uh, you notice in baseball that a pitcher, how many pitchers, how many pitches do they throw? They throw a, a fastball, a curveball, a slider, a changeup. Some throw a forkball, some throw a screwball, some throw a, a, a circle change up <laughs> all these different pitches that they throw but um some throw a knuckleball uh, but if you're going to be a uh if you if you're going to be a professional baseball player and you're just going to be a reliever the guy that comes in and pitches about one inning at a time you know how many pitches you need to know really good to be a reliever two pitches that's it if you're going to be a reliever and just go for a short distance a short little sprint you really just need a fastball and one other pitch, a fastball and a slider, a fastball and a curveball, a fastball and a changeup, just a fastball and one other pitch, and you can be the best pitcher for one inning. But if you want to be a starting pitcher, if you want to be a pitcher that goes the distance, well, you're going to need at least three or four, maybe even five. <laughs> and you hear of these pitchers, and in the offseason, they, they try to add to their arsenal. They spend all summer trying to perfect the grip on this baseball so they can throw a changeup. They spend all summer trying to perfect the angle that they throw their slider, different things, trying to, trying to make it so that they have more to their arsenal that they can add so that they can be better at what they're doing. And I think baseball players, pitchers, they do all that trying to add to their arsenal well, it reminds me of first, second Peter chapter one. We need to add this to our faith. More than a baseball pitcher needs to add another pitch. We need to add to our faith these things. Don't just add one of them. It's not like, oh, I'm doing pretty good in the area of virtue, or I'm doing pretty good in the area of brotherly kindness. No, you don't want just one or two of them. You want all of them. You want all seven. We want to add all of these things to our list. And we need to give it all diligence. It's the priority. These things are the top priority. And so then let's go through the list. Secondly, we see the proclamation of these things. What are these things? Uh, first of all on the list, add to your faith virtue. And virtue, there's lots of different uh, definitions that can be used of virtue because the word itself is actually the root word for manliness. But, you know, in the Old Testament, we talk of virtuous women. So we're not talking about manly women or anything like that. But what does virtue mean? It just means moral excellence. That's all it means. It just means someone that, so it's, it's once you're a Christian, it's time to say goodbye to sin, okay? Once you're a Christian, it's time to start living like a Christian. Once you're a Christian, it's time to start living right and acting right. And the things you used to do, you don't do them anymore. You've escaped the pollution that is in the world through lust. Now that you're a Christian, it's time to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So add to your faith virtue, that those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Then add to virtue knowledge. 
knowledge. Now, we just said in verses 1 to 4, we have the knowledge of him. Yes, and we're to add knowledge. It's interesting. The word is actually a little different in verses 1 to 4 and verse 8 than it is in verse number 5 here. In verse number 5, it's referring to a full knowledge of him. In verses 1 to 4, it's a recognition of him. It's, it's like, I, I see him. I know who that is. I know him as my Savior. But now in verse 5, it's, yes, but do you know him? How well do you know him? Getting to know everything there is to know about him. Once you're a Christian, you need to become a student, a student of Christ. You need to learn all you can learn about him. Pay attention to his words, to his, take note of his actions, consider his character, take knowledge of him, and strive to be like him. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge. The next one there is temperance. In verse number six, and to knowledge temperance. Temperance simply means self-control. It's disciplining yourself. It's keeping your body in subjection to the, to the word of God and to the will of God, to the spirit of God. It's simply learning how to tell yourself no. Learning how to tell yourself no and, and being able to, uh, you know, once, the fact is, once you're a Christian, it's not like your flesh just goes away. You have to deal with it every day. You've got to do battle with it every day. And if we're going to be the Christian that God wants us to be, we need to learn how to tell our flesh no, to mortify the flesh, to mortify the members that are upon the earth, to keep it in subjection and control your passions and lusts and learn how to say no to self. It's not virtue, then knowledge, then temperance. Verse six, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, Patience, patience, learn how to wait, learn how to wait on the Lord, learn how to wait for God's blessing, learn to not expect everything right away. The word patient is simply in reference to a faithful person. It's referring to someone that's consistent. It's a person who doesn't change based on their circumstances. Uh, they, they learned in the good and in the bad to trust in the Lord and to be the Christian that God wants them to be. The patient person is the one who waits for God to show what to do next. He's learned not to react, you know, not to just react to his circumstances, but to wait and to pray and to see what the will of the Lord is. Patience in the text, it's specifically referring to enduring trials and afflictions. When things go wrong, don't just get upset. Don't get angry. Don't lose your fuse. Don't, don't give up or give in. But learn patience. And the trial of your faith worketh patience. And in hard times, you can learn to trust God, to lean on him. Learn that he can be depended on no matter what you're facing. Add to your faith patience. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience. At the end of verse six there, and to patience godliness. Godliness, that just means that you're godlike, that you're like God. In a literal sense, it refers to piety. It refers to having a holy re reverence for God, for his laws, to the point where someone will not allow themselves to do something contrary to the will of God, to the word of God. You know, when your kids and you, when your parents are, were teaching you right and wrong, at first you didn't do what was wrong because you didn't want the consequences of what would happen if you did what was wrong. But eventually you got to the point where you loved your parents <laughs> and you just did it because you didn't want to offend your parents, because you didn't want to offend your parents because you love your parents. 
Well, as Christians, we need to get to that point where we just don't want to offend God. We want to be like him. We want our outward actions to show our devotion to him, have a heart inward reality of the heart uh, yearning for God is shown on the outside. Godliness is just a yearning for God. Have you added that to your faith? You know, people thirst for the world. They thirst for to please men and to not offend them. But we need to add godliness. Add to your faith godliness. Number six, add to your faith brotherly kindness. Verse seven, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, the word that's used there, it's the word Philadelphia, which just means brotherly love. And it's a love that Christians are to have for others. For other Christians, it's a love by which all men would know that they are his disciples. It's love for one another. You know, personally, I am glad that this is number six on the list. Because <laughs> this one's hard. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I got to practice the other five first. I'm just being silly. But um, you know the expression, living above with saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. Living below with saints we know. Well, that's a different story. <laughs> no, 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 no. But we need to have love for one another. We need to have affection for one another. We need to be kind to one another because we're a family. We're the family of God. You know, I hope that in your earthly family, you are kind to one another. Uh, when I called Rose on the phone today, she, someone else answered the phone. It was her sister. Her sister was there to visit her. I said, oh, Rose, I've never met your sister before. But anyways, Rose's sister was there. And as siblings, take care of one another. Show kindness to one another. I remember as a kid, I know firsthand how easy it is to fight with siblings. You know how I know that? Because I have two brothers. And growing up, we played street hockey almost every day. <laughs> and so needless to say, there were some disagreements. But... I can also tell you that me and my brothers, we love each other. And the whole time we were growing up, if ever anybody touched one of the other brothers, they had two other big guys they had to deal with. So that didn't happen too often, if you know what I mean. But anyways, but my mother forced us to love one another. She said, if you don't love each other, how are you going to love anybody else? So we had to love one another. And uh, that's how we teach our families. And yet we're in a far greater family. We're, we all have the same father. We all share the heavenly father. We have accepted Christ as our savior and we have by his power become the sons of God. And as a child of God, do you love your family? Do you have that brotherly kindness, that brotherly love for your siblings in Christ? Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness to godliness brotherly kindness and last of all charity charity is called in other passages the bond of perfectness charity is what brings it all together if you have charity real bible charity you'll have the other six it all will come together with that and charity is simply love and action it's not just feeling that affection for your brother or kindness to your words your brother but now it's showing it, it's sacrificially showing that love for others. Be willing to show others your love. Be willing to open up those bowels of compassion for somebody else. Add to your faith brotherly kindness. Now that's the love that God showed us when he so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. And now if we say we're the sons of God, if we say we love him, 1 John 4 says, we need to show our love to one another. It's charity. Have you added it to your faith? These are seven things that we are to add to our faith. Seven things that are so important. I wonder this evening, do you understand why they're so important? What difference does it make? What difference does it make if I'm virtuous or I have the knowledge of Christ or of temperance or patience, godliness, brotherly kindness or charity? 
What does it profit anyways? Why is Peter emphasizing this so much as he writes this last letter? Well, he tells us in verses 8 to 11, first of all, the profit of these things is fruit. If we want to be fruitful Christians, then we need to add to our faith these things. On Sunday, we saw that if we're to be fruitful Christians, we need to abide in him. That's the priority. Abide in him. And as we abide in him, we will add the, if we're reading his word and living out the Christian life, we will add to our faith these things. These things. Uh, you notice in verse 8 what it says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we saw the emphasis on knowing him. It's in the knowledge of him that there's salvation. That's the start of it. We got saved by grace through faith. We got saved because we know him whom to know is life eternal. We have everything that's mentioned in verses one to four because we know him. But if we're going to be fruitful, if we're going to be successful Christians, if we're going to if we're going to have a Christian life that bears fruit, then we must add these things. These things, without these things, we will not bear the fruit that God wants us to bear. You must bear, you must have these things in order to bear fruit. What do these things profit us? They, they allow us to bear fruit, but they also, they also give us the right perspective. They give us the right perspective. Verse number nine says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He that lacketh these things is blind. He, he has no spiritual sight. He can't see afar off. Who is this person? Who is the person that doesn't have these things? simple. He, he's the person that only sees today. He's the Christian that only sees what's right in front of him. He's the lot that has set his tent towards Sodom and is looking there but can't see God and God in the throne room. He's the Christian that lives for now. And he's the Christian that forgets that he's been forgiven of his sins and he's supposed to be living for heaven with eternity values in view. He's that Christian that's vexing his righteous soul every day with the seeing and the hearing of their unlawful deeds. He lacks these things, and he has no spiritual vision. We need these things, don't we? Because if someone says, well, it doesn't matter, you know, virtue, what's virtuous to my moral excellence? It doesn't matter if I'm like Christ in that way. No. It does matter because there's more to live for than today. Life isn't about just pleasing ourselves. We're not living for today. We're living for eternity. And we must live with eternity's values in view. There's more to life than just what your eyes can see. The Bible tells us we don't look at the things which are seen. People make decisions today based on what they see. They make decisions based on earthly things. But we don't live for the things that are seen, but we live for the things which are not seen. The things that are seen, they're temporal. They're just going to, they're not going to last. Second Peter 3 will tell us they're all going to be dissolved. They're not going to endure the fire. But the things which are not seen, they endure, they are eternal. They endure unto life everlasting. And we need to see what's really important. And how do we get these things? How do you see what's invisible? You just add to your faith these things. Add to your faith these things. Add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And as you add that to your faith, you'll get the right perspective. You'll get the perspective that allows you to see past this world. The profit of these things is fruit. It's perspective. Then thirdly, it's security. In verse 10, wherefore the rather brethren 
Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Security. He's not stating that a Christian, if he doesn't do these things, then he loses his salvation. No, verses 1 to 4 is already true. But no, he's talking here about having, um, having that right standing, about finishing the race properly, about making it across the finish line, not as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, being a castaway. You know, most people that, you know, we've all heard of people that haven't finished well. You know, you don't have to not finish well. You, you can finish well. Uh, sometimes you might think you can't. I, uh, I saw Kyron today, who's uh, interning with Pastor Tim at Elam, and um, he's a young guy from Faithway Baptist College, and he grew up in Faithway Baptist Church. And so we were talking about Faithway, and he asked me, who were the teachers there when you were there? I went through the list. These were my teachers. I get through the list and I say, you know, really, of all those teachers I just mentioned, only one is really still the same as what he was back then when I went to that college. This isn't the students, this is the teachers. These are the ones that were the pastors there. And, and out of all of them, only one is still what he was. And the majority of them are completely off the rails and haven't finished well. And... Uh, you know, it was, I was like, man, that's a little discouraging when you think of that, that all these ones didn't finish well. And it makes you think, well, can you finish well? Is that possible? Is it possible to get to the end and still be faithful? Still, it is. You just got to add to your faith these things. If you add to your faith these things, ye shall never fall. And while Yes, you can think of those that didn't finish. We can also think of those who did. We can think of those like Pastor Rockwood. You can think of those that you've seen. I think I, I saw on Facebook today that a pastor, all, I think most of you know, Pastor Victor Burl celebrating his 75th wedding anniversary today <laughs> or someday recently. He's, he's still finishing strong and you can finish strong. You just got to add to your faith these things and we have security we have security we're standing on solid ground we will not fall or make our calling and election sure if we add these things and then finally the last one on the list we have eternal rewards by adding to our faith these things verse 11 for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Interesting, I, I found this very interesting. The word there, ministered, is the same word in verse number five when it tells us to add. Add to your faith. Now, we were to add these things, add them, super, uh, add them generously in verses 5 to 7. If we add these things generously, then when we get to heaven, God will generously give us an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of God. Uh, it's an abundant entrance here. Uh, the, the phrase that's used there in verse 11 is the same kind of phrase that, re, that they would use in those days for the Olympics, for the Greek Olympics, when a, uh, when a victorious runner, a champion runner, would return to his hometown, they would give him what they called an abundant entrance as he paraded through the streets and they celebrated him getting home. And uh, we'll see that actually sometime this summer in, in Halifax when Nathan McKinnon comes to town and I'm sure they'll give him a parade to celebrate he won the Stanley Cup. And there he is, our local hero, coming home with the Stanley Cup. Anyways, I like hockey. It's, it's Nate's favorite player because his name's Nathan and he's from Halifax. But anyways, but they'll give him an abundant entrance as he comes here. 
well, don't you know that you can have an abundant entrance into heaven? Uh, you can have an entrance into heaven where they stand up to receive you. You say, where do you see that in the Bible? Well, I see in the Bible that there was a man who heaven stood up to receive. You remember when Stephen died and he looked and he saw, we know that our Savior is seated at the right hand of the Father. But when Stephen is about to die, he looks up and he sees our Savior standing at the right hand of the Father. Why is he standing? I believe he's standing to give Stephen an abundant entrance home. He's standing up to welcome him, standing up to receive him there into heaven. And personally, I believe that when Stephen entered through those pearly gates, I believe that all of heaven stood up. You say, why do you think that, Pastor Luke? Because if you're in heaven and the Savior stands up, do you remain seated? <laughs> you stand up too. And they stood up as Stephen was welcomed home. And you know, we can have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the everlasting kingdom. But in order to receive it, you must add to your faith these things. Have you added these to your faith? Have you added virtue, that moral excellence? Have you grown in your knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Are you learning to say no to your flesh? Have you added to your faith temperance? Have you added patience? Have you learned to patiently endure the trials of life? Have you added godliness, that reverence for your heavenly Father, and be like him? Have you added brotherly kindness? Do you love the family of God? That's your family now. Have you added charity? Are you showing your love by actions? Are these things a priority? You know, Peter, he's on his deathbed. Now, he wasn't deathly ill. What it was was he was about to give his life for the Savior. And he takes the time to write one more letter, one more letter to the saints, because he wants to make sure that after he departs, they remember these things. These things are important. Have you added them to your faith? Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for the text that we looked at this evening. Lord, I pray that we will add these things, that we will be the Christians that you'd have us to be, that we won't uh, settle for a worldly Christian life, but that we'll step out by faith and strive to be like Jesus and be the Christians that you've called us to be. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.